All right, welcome to episode number seven from our Evolution 2 series. And in this episode, we're going to go over the process of speciation. Uh, this will be sort of a long episode. We've got some really good information in here. So make sure you pay attention because some of the terms are definitely going to be on your tests and quizzes. So if we're going to talk about speciation, which is the process of making a new species, we need to come up with a definition of what a species is. In our book, uses the standard classic definition of a species. It's a group of organisms that can breed with each other and they produce fertile offspring. And what fertile means is that the babies can later have their own babies. Okay? So, for example, <clears throat> when a horse and a donkey mate and they produce a mule, the mule is not able to produce its own young. So it's not a fertile offspring. And that's one of the um, that's why we can say that a donkey and a horse are a separate species because they do not create a fertile offspring. Now the mule is a hybrid, which means it's a mixture of two separate species, but it's not fertile. Uh, so that fits our definition of a species. Now, speciation, and the definition is right here. It's the process that creates new species. And it really depends upon a phenomenon called reproductive isolation. Reproductive isolation is simply a, a process where one population is not allowed to mate with the other population. And so what can happen is that these two populations can diverge. If you can remember, divergent evolution, they can diverge into different species. But if this gene pool intermingles with this gene pool, they're going to maintain their same species status. So that reproductive isolation is really, really important. All right, on the next slide, we're going to talk about the three main types of reproductive isolation. First one is called behavioral isolation. There's certain mating behaviors that keeps one population from mating with another. Uh, another one that comes into play a lot is geographical isolation. This is one of the main ones that we saw in Darwin's finches because each finch was on a different island. And we also see this in uh, continents because you can have mountainous barriers that separate one population from another. You can have large bodies of water such as the Great, La Great Lakes. Also, the oceans separate populations from North America, from Europe, and even, to some extent, from North America to South America. So geographical isolation can really separate populations. And then of course number three is temporal isolation. Temporal isolation is when the different populations or different species will mate at different times of the day, different times of the month, or different times of the year. So look at, let's look at each of these individually in a little bit more detail. All right. Behavioral isolation is one of my favorite things because it really deals with a process called sexual selection. <laughs> sexual selection is a type of natural selection where you're choosing to mate with this individual over another. Um, in human beings, it could come down to your looks, your op occupation, uh, how much money you have in the bank, what's your personality like. Those are all uh, parts of sexual selection. But in the animal world, it typically comes with mating rituals, which we see a lot in fish, birds, and insects. And when it comes to land animals, we see these strategies over here <clears throat> where you have like, think of the big horn sheep uh, out in Colorado in the Rockies where they're going to bang their head. The males are going to bang their heads together and whoever wins these battles is going to control the females in the herd and he's going to be the only one that mates with them. And he's going to fight off any other uh, males so that he can maintain his mating status. All right. So we see this a lot in the animal kingdom where you're fighting to maintain your status as the top dog, so to speak. All right. Got this great video down here. Uh, one of the neatest birds are the birds of paradise. And you find these over in Southeast Asia on an island named Papua New Guinea. And what we see in this film is going to be the mating dance of the superb uh, bird of paradise. 
Normally, it just looks black. It's just a normal black bird, and you can tell that it's got a little bit of blue on its belly, but that blue comes into play when it's displaying to make a mate. Now, this mating ritual is real important. If he doesn't display and do his dance right, he's not going to get a mate. So very, very important because only the females will mate with, with gentlemen who can perform this dance correctly. So short clip. Enjoy. It's quite entertaining. Okay, so you can see here, quite an elaborate dance, and that's not unusual for birds to do this. So that's just a, a very great, that's an excellent example of a mating ritual. All right, so let's move on. <clears throat> All right, in this case, we have a frog. This is a common tree frog that you're going to find in North America, and it has two very, very similar species. In fact, to a normal person, you can't really look at species A and species B and tell the difference between them. It comes down to their mating ritual. All right, so these are from the Hyla genus. And so we have one species called Hyla versicolor. And then its sister species is Hyla chrysocellus. And it comes down to their croaks. All right, so here's the mating croak. You're trying to attract a mate. And this is just the markout pattern of it. So this species goes croak, 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 croak croak, 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 to attract its mates, where Hyia chrysocellus goes croaky, 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 croaky. So obviously, if you are a female of this species, you will not be attracted to this mating call. You're only going to be attracted to this mating call, and it's going to be vice versa. All right? So mating calls can, can be a part of sexual selection also. All right, a geographic isolation. This is a case where there's a geographic barrier that separates one population from another. And over here in this picture, we've got a, a, a population of beetles. comes in all different colors. Some are kind of green. Uh, some are dark brown. Some are light brown. Uh, for some reason, there's some change in the geology. And now there's a river. This river separates the two populations. The beetles can't swim across the river. They're not going to be able to intermate. Uh, now we're starting to see some genetic variety. We're seeing some selection pressure. Maybe on this western side of the river, there's more green foliage, so the green beetles have an advantage. Maybe on the eastern side of the river, it's more sandy, more desert-like, maybe more dirt. So the brown ones have a higher advantage. And then for some reason, we have a change in climate. The river dries up. Now the two populations can intermingle, but there's been enough time where they've developed um, their own type of reproductive isolation where the light colored ones will not mate with the green ones and vice versa. And now we are a brand new species. All right. Temporal isolation. Temporal isolation deals with the time of the day, time of the month, or time of the year when a species is going to go into its mating season. And so here we have an example of a wood frog. Uh, the wood frog is going to mate, eh, let's say, second or third week of, of March, and then a very close relative, the leopard frog, is going to mate about three to four weeks later. So think of the middle of April. Because the peak of the mating is a month apart, these two frogs are not going to mate with each other, and therefore their gene pools are going to stay separate. And that's how they become a separate species. All right, so I want you to remember behavioral isolation, different mating behaviors and strategies separate different populations. Geographical isolation, there's some kind of geographical barrier, a river, a mountain, a desert, that's going to keep two populations from mating with each other, and then they will diverge into different species. And then here in this example, temporal isolation, species A mates at one time of the year, species B mates at the another time of the year, they'll never mix their genes together because they're mating at different times. All right, uh, we have another section in our chapter that deals with the research on the grants uh, down in Galapagos on Darwin's finches. And we pretty much have the six-step process on how Darwin's finches have evolved into their different species. So first we had some of the founders arrive on the Galapagos. Uh, they probably were blown out to sea by a storm, and they kept flying until they found land. And luckily, 
Few of them found the Galapagos Islands. There was a separation of populations, which can happen. Some moved to this island, some moved to that island, some moved to this island. Now, because they were on different islands, there would be separations of their gene pools. If you're on this island, you're probably not going to mate with another uh, bird that's on an island 20 miles away. That's going to lead to reproductive isolation. Um, these birds will have a different mating strategy. 20 miles away on a different island, they'll have a different mating strategy. And then we have ecological competition. These guys are evolved to survive in this habitat. These are evolved to survive in this habitat. There's no incentive for this bird to come over to this to go to a new habitat because they're not adapted to it. And that's going to lead to continued evolution as long as these finches do not go extinct. Okay, that's going to end our... Um, this episode on speciation and reproductive isolation. So until the next episode, we're going to catch you on the flip side.